Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have tonight to study your word again. Thank you because of the presence of your spirit. Thank you for your love. Thank you because we know that you are going to lead us into the study of the scriptures. And we're going to get deep into the study and we're going to benefit in a very serious way tonight in Jesus' name. We ask you, O oh Lord, that you open our hearts to your word and open your word to our hearts so that what you have for us in your word will benefit and receive in Jesus' name. We pray that grace and power, strength, spiritual strength will come with your word and it will be beneficial to every one of us and move us forward, help us to have greater faith in you and greater expectancy in you as we study your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that the normal blessings that those who study your word receive, you grant to every one of us. Bless everyone, Lord. We pray that nobody will come to this Bible study and go back the same way in Jesus' name. We welcome your presence, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you take all distractions away from us to get the very best out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study once again tonight. We've been studying Second Peter. That he is the second epistle of Peter to the people of God. Now we study 18. And I have emphasized to you as we have gone through this second epistle of Peter. That Peter has been talking about the second coming of the Lord. As you look at it from chapter 1, in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were high eyewitnesses of his majesty. So then you know from the very first chapter that the apostle was talking about the second coming. But the problem was that many people had risen up and they were contradicting the words of the Lord. And they were challenging and questioning and doubting the coming of the Lord. Because of that, he had to take time to explain to the people of God why it seems there has been a delay. If you look at chapter 3, verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, doubters, unbelievers, the disputers, those who argue against the word of God, walking after their own laws and saying, where is the promise of his coming? So then, you know the challenge now facing the apostle. There were people that were challenging, questioning the coming of the Lord. They were asking, not just privately, but publicly. And they were challenging the message of the coming of the Lord. Then in verse 8, it says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Well, the people have been saying that, but it's been long. If you say this, how long are we going to wait again? That's why he had to talk about the long suffering of the Lord in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. He began to explain to the people of God the reason why it appeared that there was a delay in the fulfillment of the coming of the Lord. And then in verse 12, he tells us, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. He says, it's coming. Therefore, the believers have a responsibility, and that is looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Now, he comes to deal with this matter of the long suffering of the Lord. Because here is what the people was misunderstanding. They didn't understand why it was this long. Actually, this point of the long suffering of the Lord, he picked up in the first epistle. In the first epistle, chapter 3, verse 20. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 20. We sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, 
while the ark was a preparing wherein field that is its souls were saved by water it tells us that if you look back into history you'll find that god had waited before and he had the reason for waiting the reason for waiting is because he does not want anyone to perish and because of his love and he's been waiting but these other people the scoffers and the doubters and the unbelievers they didn't understand the long suffering of the lord they thought delay meant denial it meant god had forgotten his promise that's the reason it now comes to verses 15 and 16 of second peter chapter 3 god's long suffering misinterpreted and misunderstood and it's, it's very important because in our lives as well there are times the lord has given us a promise and it appears there is a delay and we're wondering in our mind we're wondering in our hearts why is the delay you need to understand tonight that there are times that god will wait and god waits like that he manifests long suffering like that he manifests patience like that because he has a good reason a good purpose and that good reason is for you it's everyone that believes on the lord look at what he said here in second peter chapter 3 verse 15 an account that the long suffering of our lord is salvation notice that notice that the long suffering of our lord is for the purpose of our salvation even as a beloved brother paul also according to the wisdom given unto him as reaching unto you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in the which are some things had to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction uh, the thing that is emphasized here is the long suffering of the lord and this is what the people was misunderstanding misrepresenting since the time of the fall of man in the garden of eden man has always misrepresented god misinterpreted god and misunderstood the plan of god and the actions of god and the commandments of god his love is misinterpreted his judgments are misunderstood if there is any delay of the judgment of god that delay is interpreted is reckoned as inability to uphold his laws oh the people say there you see he threatened he was going to judge he threatened he was going to punish he threatened he was going to do this if we did that i sit on it now they misunderstand the delay the suspension of the judgment of god and he counts that as inability to uphold his laws or may, they might say they count it as meaning he has changed his mind because he's not done what he said and he has changed his mind his laws are no more binding on anyone on the other hand if he judged his people that sinned they will regard that judgment as a proof of his inability to fulfill his promises they'll go to the side of the promises of god he said i will have mercy he said i will love he said it's even unconditional i will love you forever and see now god as judge whatever god does if he delays the judgment they misunderstand if he brings the judgment immediately they also misunderstand until this present hour the love of god the forbearance of God and the long suffering of God is still misinterpreted, is still misunderstood by unbelievers and even believers. The scoffers and the false teachers at the time of the apostles, they regarded the delay of the coming of Christ to judge the world as an evidence that he will never come. Since he has not come all these years, their conclusion was he will not come again. They did not see it as an evidence of God's love. For the Lord, we are told in the passage I read to you, it's not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but he is long suffering towards what? Not willing, not desiring, not planning, not wishing. Not willing that any should perish, but that all, everyone, should come to repentance. And these some believers and scoffers and doubters, instead of seeing the delay as a proof of God's desire that we should be saved, 
Many of them had misinterpreted and misunderstood God's long suffering and had come to the conclusion that our Lord Jesus Christ will not return. But I want to assure you, and I'm sure you believe, Jesus will come again as he promised. He is coming again. And nothing will hinder his coming. If there appears to be any delays because of the love of God for us. There are three points we are going to look at as we look at the study tonight. Number one, the patience of God and his long suffering. The patience of God and his long suffering. Number two, Paul's perception of God's love and our salvation. Paul's perception of God's love and our salvation then number three the perversion of god's love and the scriptures the perversion of god's love and the scriptures number one the patience of god and his long suffering as we look at second peter chapter three again we're looking at the first part of verse 15 an account that is reckoned that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long suffering of our God is salvation. That is the purpose of God's patience, the purpose of God's waiting, the purpose of the delay. Why Christ had not come is so that you can be saved, so that we can be saved. Ask a question what if Jesus came? 30 years ago. What if Jesus came 20 years ago? Where will many people be who have been saved between the last uh, 30 years or 20 years and this time? The reason he has waited and the reason he has manifested his patience and the reason for the long suffering is so that he'll give you chance, he'll give us chance, he'll give our relatives chance so that they can be saved, born again, snatched from the hands of the devil brought into the kingdom of god and so that they can escape the eternal judgment of the almighty god god's promises can never fail the promises of scripture they are certain the prophecy of christ's second coming is yet for an appointed time and it will surely come look at habakkuk habakkuk chapter 2 and there in verse 3 you'll see what the lord is saying god is not going to uh, deny himself or deny his promise for the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end it shall speak and not lie though it tarry wait for it though it tarry wait for it though it appears there is a delay wait for it because it will surely come and will not tarry the conclusion of the scoffers was drawn out of their misunderstanding of the patience of God and the long suffering of the Lord. And of course, you know that that is what people normally do because wrong conclusions drawn out of misinterpretations of the word of God and the plan of God will lead to the hardness of the sinner's heart. When a sinner takes the word of God, an unbeliever takes the word of God, a backslider takes the word of God. And then the word of God is saying that there's judgment. There's judgment. There's judgment. And then he does something wrong and there's no judgment. He blasphemes God and there's no judgment. He rebels against God and there's no judgment. He disobeys the word of God and, it, and there's no judgment. He sees blatantly, openly, and there is no judgment. The conclusion in his mind is, if it is true, there's going to be judgment. And if God was going to uphold this word, see what I did. Is that not against the commandment of God? Why didn't God judge me? That's what we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. And if you happen to be like that, of that mind, you do something wrong, you go against the commandments of God, and it appears judgment has not come. And you do not understand the long suffering of God, the patience of God is just waiting for you so that you can repent, so you will not perish. And then you're hiding your heart and you're hiding yourself. That because the judgment has not come, it means it will never come. Look at chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes verse 11. It says, because sentence, verdict, judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, immediately. It says, therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. But look at the next verse. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times. First time, second time, 
They say seven is a significant number. Seven's time, and there's no judgment. Ten's time, twentieth time, twenty-fifth time, there is no judgment. Though a sinner do evil, and hundred times his days, and his days be prolonged. Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. That is, the hearts of sinners, the hearts of unbelievers, and the hearts of backsliders, they are hardened, because I've done it, I've done it, I've done it, and there's no judgment. The delay they misinterpret that delay to mean there will never be any judgment therefore let me go on i can do what i want i can do what i please on the other hand even believers believers uh, in in our own case when there is a delay instead of hardening our heart it brings sorrow in our heart when we're, we're expecting god to fulfill his promise we're preach about it and then the prophecy that we're being given that we're going to be taken away out of this world and here we remain in tribulation and trouble and trial and temptation and persecution and pain and we're saying lord how long how long you see that delay because of that delay we begin to think maybe it will not come again and it gives us sorrow in our heart for the unbelievers it gives them hardness of heart for the believer it gives us sorrow in our heart in first thessalonians chapter 4 first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 but i will not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope it makes us to go the way of almost hopelessness the persecution will never end the pain will never end. This trial and this trouble will never end. And Jesus said it will come so that all these persecutions will come to an end. It gives us sorrow as if we will remain in that problem, in that situation forever and ever. That's why the apostle was telling the believers, he said, don't be sorrowful as people that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, shall not prevent, shall not come before them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, 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 when the people, when some believers are thinking the delay means they'll not come again, the delay means that I'll continue in my pain, in my persecution, in my trouble in my trials wherefore when they are thinking like that and there's sorrow in their heart comfort one another with these words so you understand then that sinners the thing that god will not do it again but we want to talk to the sinners they should not infer that because god does not cut them down that therefore that means they will never be punished or that god is not faithful to his threatenings they should rather regard the long suffering of God and the patience of God as a proof that He is willing to save them. Life is prolonged for a sinner so that he'll have opportunity to repent and be saved. We're talking about the patience of God and the long suffering of God. Look at some scriptures about this in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 18. And therefore, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. And therefore, will the Lord wait? You see this now. The Lord will wait. Will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you? The reason the Lord is waiting. The reason the Lord has not fulfilled the promises you think he should have fulfilled, the reason why the prophecy had not been fulfilled is that he might be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment, of justice, of righteousness. Blessed are all they that wait for him. If the Lord is long-suffering and patient, you be patient to you and wait for the Lord. In Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 
verse 24. We're looking at the reason why God waits. And uh, sometimes we don't understand. Why is he waiting? Why is he just looking like that? Romans chapter 9, verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction. Actually, this is referring back to the story of the children of Israel when they were in Egypt and then the hardness of the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh had in his heart, had in his heart, had in his heart over and over and over again. The children of Israel must have been wondering, is it that God is not able to deliver us? Can't just God perform the last final miracle and break the camel's back and destroy the hardness of heart of Pharaoh. But then God wanted to show his power because you see, these children of Israel, they have been in Egypt for generations and they had not known about the true God, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And they had not known of the power of the almighty God. They had not seen miracles for centuries. Now God wanted to take them out of the land of Egypt. He wanted that situation to make the children of Israel know that it's a God of might. That's why the first plague came, and the second plague came, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. Just went on like that until then the final one came. The reason he waited is not that he couldn't have taken them out just at the first time, but it says, what if God, willing to show his role, and to make his power known, and to make his power known, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared unto glory, even us whom he has called. Not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. The reason why God has waited and the reason why God has shown that long suffering is so that you can have the grace of God and you can have the goodness of God upon your life. That's why he's waiting. So don't misinterpret the patience of God and the long suffering of God uh, to mean that, ah, that thing, I thought that thing was sinful. And I thought if I did that thing, God would just knock me on the head and kill me and throw me to hell. And I did it the first time. And in fact, there was no consequence at all. I tried it second time. No consequence at all. I tried it the third time. No consequence at all. It means that that thing is no more a sin. It used to be a sin in the Old Testament. It used to be a sin in the New Testament. It used to be a sin long, long ago. But I've tried it and tried it and tried it now. And God didn't judge me. That means the thing is not sinful anymore. My friend, God is only waiting so that... You'll come to the point of repentance and there'll be a change in your life. That's why the Lord has been waiting. We count the waiting of God, the long suffering of God, the patience of God for our salvation. It's not that He has changed His mind. It's not that the laws of God have changed. It's not that the standard, the righteous standard of the Lord, it's not that it has changed. It is because He's waiting for you so that you repent and you will not perish. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, here Paul was talking about his conversion. He was talking about the mercy of God and the grace of God that came unto him in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 16. How be it for this reason, for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He said, if you are wondering about all the things that Saul of Tarsus, what he did, why God did not snatch him away and kill him and destroy him immediately? If you are wondering, why is it that God waited and waited until he got to the Damascus road and he became converted? He said, it's the long suffering of God and it's a pattern of God. It's a model. It's the example for you so that you'll know no matter how far you have gone, no matter what evil you have done, and no matter what injury you have caused, the church of the living God, he was patient for me. Paul said, he was long suffering for me and he manifested his grace his love and his mercy and is willing to extend the same hand of love to you if you hold on that hand of love and mercy and goodness today and then you will be forgiven your life will be turned around in james chapter 5 james chapter 5 verses 7 and 8 the long suffering of god the love of god the patience of god james 5 verse 7 
Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. It says when the farmer plants, there is a first rain, the early rain that comes so that that seed will grow, that crop will grow. And then before the harvest time, there is the latter rain that comes so that there will be a perfect Affecting, a maturing, a ripening of the fruit. It says the flock of God or the vineyard of the Lord is like that. The Lord is looking for ripened fruit. And the Lord is looking for uh, the fruit to be matured and for you to be perfected and purged and purified and made ready and made holy for the coming of the Lord. It says that the reason the Lord has been waiting is pouring out the early rain and then the latter rain referring to the Holy Ghost so that he can mature the church and prepare the church and make the church a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle that's why the lord has been waiting then in verse 8 it says be ye also patient Slab establish your hearts for the coming of the lord draws near god is patient you be patient God is long-suffering, you be long-suffering. And if you are a child of God, have the same characteristics and the attributes of God. If God is patient with us, why well, are we not patient with one another? Are we always in a hurry? In a hurry to judge. In a hurry to condemn. In a hurry to criticize, in a hurry to take the stick of judgment and the stick of destruction and beat one another in the head. If God has been patient for you, all those things you have done, all these years, God could have judged you. He had the power. He had the knowledge. He knew the things you have done. And he knew how he could have condemned you and totally destroyed you. If God has been patient with you, and he's saying he will change. He will repent. And no matter what you did, he kept on pouring the rain on you and the sunshine on you. Why is it on little, little, little things? We condemn one another. We criticize one another. We destroy one another. We judge one another. Because of those little, little things. Ah, ah. The master said, I forgive you that great debt. And I did that great thing for you. And I was patient with you. Couldn't you have been patient for your fellow servant, for your fellow brother, for your fellow sister? If God will deal with you like you deal with other people, will you still be alive today? Be ye patient also. If God is patient with you, if God is long-suffering and is waited for you until this time, so you can be born again, you can be saved, and now he has forgiven you and doesn't remember the sins against you anymore. What God has manifested to you, manifest unto other people also. Actually, the patience of God ought to be leading us somewhere. The patience of God ought to be having a particular effect in our lives. That's why it says in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4 all through to verse 6. Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it says, Or despisest thou? The riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. How do you take the goodness of God and the long suffering of God? When you have committed particular sin, and the Spirit of God knocked at your heart, meant, that meant conviction. This is not good, this is not right. Be holy as I am. Be ye perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And the Lord reminded you, these cannot be right. These cannot be right. You did it the second time. And the Spirit of God said, didn't I tell you the other time? You are a child of God. You are not an unbeliever. You gave your life to the Lord. You surrender to the Lord. This is not right. It doesn't befit a child of God. And you did it again. And then eventually, you forget about it. You keep on doing it and keep on doing it. If it is stealing, you keep on stealing and stealing and stealing. And the conscience is becoming quiet now. And you are thinking God is not even speaking about it again. 
God has forgotten it about it. He has, he has allowed me. He has given me my own license. You know, if, if, you are very, if you are very determined and you keep on stealing and keep on stealing and keep on doing that evil thing, eventually God might just make you a special man, a special woman and give you your license that I've given you your license. You can go ahead. Not knowing that the long suffering of God and the patience of God and the goodness of God is meant to lead you to repentance. And then it says in verse 5, But after the hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up unto yourself, wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He wants you to know that if he's been patient with you, it's not that he gave you license, you can now do whatever you want. You can now sin without even feeling guilty. And you can rebel against the commandments of God because now you have a special license to sin. No. The patience of God, the long suffering of God is supposed to lead you to repent and say, Ah, God has been very patient with me. I've done this sin over and over. And really, I know that it's not all right. And if I want to be a precious treasure in the kingdom of God, I should live a better life. I go back to God and have the grace of God so that I can live in newness of life. In Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, and he found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree, and find none. Cut it down, or I cumbereth each the ground. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. Till I shall dig about it and dung it and put some fertilizer on manure. And if it bear fruit, well, that is, you waited all these years. If you give uh, some space again, some time again, and you manifest patience and long suffering, let me walk on it again. It may bear fruit. And if it bears fruit, that will be wonderful. If not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. The long suffering of God is not forever. Would you understand? That delay does not mean that punishment will not come. It doesn't mean that God is unable to punish sinners anymore. We should just see it as a mark of the love of God that is not willing that the sinners should perish. God's goodness and forbearance and long suffering should lead us to repentance. Point number two Paul's perception of God's love and our salvation. Paul's perception of God's love. And our salvation. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and the first part of verse 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him as written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Speaking of them in these things, let's stop there for a moment. And there's a wonderful thing here. When you study the Bible, you compare scripture with scripture. And then you compare the scriptures with your own life and with your own attitude. What do we know about Peter and Paul? About their relationship. It is clear that Peter was well acquainted with the epistles of Paul. And that he regarded Paul as a beloved brother. And this is a very significant thing. It shows that Peter had a good experience for the Lord. Let me show you why. It so happened some years before this time. That they were together. That is, Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and many other believers. And Peter at this time was taking the liberty to eat with the Gentiles. And then some Jews came along. And immediately, the concept of Jews and Gentiles, they don't mix like this. And the other Jews are likely to look at Peter and say, Peter, Peter, what are you doing? 
Do you think that because we are born again, because we are children of God, because they have come into the kingdom of God by grace, that means that you will lower yourself as a Jew, and then you'll be eating with the Gentiles. Peter, what are you doing? He became afraid, and then he pulled away, and Paul was around. And Paul then said, Peter, what's the matter with you? He rebuked him sharply and openly, publicly. Isn't that what we don't like? Because our ego, when our ego is touched and hurt, it makes something to rise up in our hearts. This Paul, how can he be so audacious and so bold and to challenge me like this and even condemn me and criticize me publicly before all these other people? Doesn't, doesn't he know my position? Doesn't he know my title? Doesn't he know the place I take in the midst of the rest of the apostles? Why didn't this Paul, why didn't he call me privately? And then tell me what he wanted to say. See the way he has done the thing. And he just brought me to the open and blasted me and destroyed me. And now he has destroyed my ministry. See what he has done. Not only that, when Paul was going to write the epistle to the Galatians, he put it down, black and white. He wrote the account. And he mentioned the name of Peter. He didn't say one man. He didn't say one preacher. He didn't say one of the apostles. He mentioned his name and put it down. And even the people that were not there, they were able to read now the correction, public correction he had given to Peter. And then it is preserved in the Bible so that from generation to generation to generation we will see the shortcoming of this Peter. And Peter knew, and Peter knew that these things have been written. And he was very familiar with the epistles of Paul because that's why he said that we should account these are the patience of God. Then he said this is even what Paul had been writing about in the epistles. Now, if you were saved, that's what we're saying. Sanctified, that's what we testify. Filled with the Holy Ghost, that's our profession. And somebody challenged you openly like that. Like me. Because you know the way I challenge people. The other day, the, you remember the day I challenged you that other day? I mentioned your name. I pointed at you like this. I said, why did you do that? And you say you are a Christian. A deeper life, and you are doing that, and then discipline public and came over here after we did it in the locality in the section. I came over here, made an announcement. I said, Church, listen, if you want to stand as a Christian, stand as a Christian. The other day, we were in a particular meeting. Do you know, brother so and so? Mention your name, put it down again. And these people, if we call, they record it. If we laugh, they record it. And they put everything in cassette. And before we remember to tell them to edit it and remove that part, they have sent it to the state. And then somebody from the state, when he saw you, asked you a question. What did you do for the pastor that he did this? So you heard? It's in the cassette. Ah. That man, anything he preaches, I will not hear again. Any cassette, I will not listen. I will not read his books again. I'll be coming to church. This is my church. But that man, I tune him off. Peter could have done that. But Peter did not do that. This is Christian experience. That even after that situation, when, Paul, when Peter was referring to Paul, he referred to him as a beloved brother, not an enemy. You see, when we are sanctified, the ego is subdued, is subjected, under the power of the Spirit of God and these offenses that were counting against the other. That man does not have wisdom in communication. That preacher does not have wisdom in interpersonal relationship. That man does not know how to deal with people, how to pet people, how to be tender with people, how to preach to people, how to gather people together, how to make a good congregation. Because you know that the way he talks, he blasts this one, blasts this one, and he made it to be on record. And this man knows that they're recording all these messages. But Peter, he didn't have that attitude. That's why we come to the Bible study. So that all the negative attitudes we have had because of the offenses of the past, 
the Lord will be able to take us up and cleanse us and we forget about it and we live the life that a Christian ought to live. Look at it in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, very clear, you can't miss it. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no, no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also have found sinners, is therefore Christ a minister of sin? God forbid. You know the implication here? He was telling Peter openly before them all that Peter, you are found to be among the sinners. You find hypocrisy in your life. You find Christians in your life. It's like telling Peter, ah, uh, ah, uh, Peter. You have not come out of sin. Because you denied Christ when that maid asked you, are you one of them? You said no. Peter, now you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now you are an apostle. Now you are a leader in the church. Is this not the same pretense and hypocrisy and pulling back when people challenge you and they see what you are doing? But you know, Peter was not offended in verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Do you know the implication of what Paul was saying to Peter? Or saying, Paul, do you, Peter, do you know what you are doing? If you build again the things you once destroyed, you make yourself a transgressor. Now, with that background, that open challenge, that open rebuke that Peter gave, that Paul gave to Peter. One thing that I appreciate, which I'm learning, which I want you to learn, is that Peter still read the epistles of Paul. We know he did because you can see all the references on your outline. If you compare Ephesians chapter 1 with 1 Peter chapter 1, not chapter 3, correct it on your outline, verses 3 and 4, you will see. If you compare not Galatians chapter 3, but Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, with 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, you will see the similarity. And if you compare Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, on and on and on. I put all these references for you. Comparing those verses in the epistles of Peter and the epistles of Paul, that you will see that Peter took time to read the epistles of Paul. No grievances, no malice, no ill feeling. Because of that thing that Paul said, I will never listen to that man again. Nothing like that. If we're children of God, ego is crushed. Self is subdued. And we just follow the Lord. And then we will not, you know, there's no retaliation here. Now, Peter could have taken an advantage. Because, you know, Paul had a lot of enemies. Paul had a lot of people that didn't agree with him. Paul had a lot of people that misunderstood his message. And Peter could have taken advantage of that. And he could have been on the side of the people that didn't appreciate Paul. But he didn't do that. Come back to 2 Peter chapter 3. What a great lesson for us. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul... Also according to the wisdom given unto him as written unto you. He didn't try to destroy the ministry of Paul towards the same people. What Paul had written to them, he supported, he affirmed. And he wasn't saying, pray for Paul that you will have wisdom. That's the attitude of some people. If they do something wrong and you correct them, their prayer request is, pray for Brother so-and-so that you will have wisdom. 
The implication is anybody that corrects them of the bad things they do so as to help them turn around, have a change of life. That person does not have wisdom. The person who loves them to correct them and to point the way of life to them. Oh, we can do it sharply. We can do it in any way. It, all those things are in the Bible, if you read your Bible. But when we correct somebody, for him, if it's not convenient, the man does not have wisdom. The next prayer request, pray for so and so that he may have wisdom. But you know, Peter did not act like that. Do you see, we come to the Bible study, is to look at our lives. is to examine our lives for the Bible. I'm not here to just read the Bible and read references without making personal application to the lives of the believers we must make application to our lives that's why we came and we shouldn't be offended that applications have been made and here you see peter you see what he was writing he was telling the people there was no retaliation saying this man i also will knock him because he knocked me according to the wisdom given unto him he has written unto you as also as in all his epistles even his epistles that you have not read in all his epistles now that's a wonderful thing uh, paul, peter was saying that paul had a good perfect perception of god's love and the salvation of god and look at what paul said on the salvation of the lord in romans chapter 5 romans chapter 5 i'm reading to you from verse 6 for when we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure for a good man. Some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And that's the understanding of Paul the Apostle concerning this, the love of God and the salvation of God. And see, it's true to scripture in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, reading from verse 3 all through to verse 7. The understanding, the perception of Paul the Apostle concerning the salvation of the Lord for the people of God. Titus chapter 3 and in verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient, deceived and serving diverse laws and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, Toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs, inheritors, according to the hope of life eternal. You'll see then that Paul the Apostle understood the love of God and he preached the full gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he rose again for our justification and that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are turned around and we have life eternal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading there from verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You see, this is the understanding of Paul the Apostle for our salvation. That Christ died for our sins. And it's according to the scriptures. And that he, he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's why Paul the, uh, Peter was saying that man had the wisdom of God. 
He said, well, I will not say because he rebuked me and because he challenged me and because he made it open and because he even put it on record and because he uh, publicized my fault. I will not say because of that that I will belittle the man and belittle his ministry. He has the wisdom of God and he has reached unto you. Not only the wisdom of God in what you have read, even in all his epistles concerning the love of God and the salvation of the people of God. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which I preach, preach of me, is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, hey, the gospel I'm preaching unto you, that all have seen, and come short of the glory of God, that by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight, that Jesus Christ had to go to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, and that when you have faith in the substitutionary sacrifice and blood of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled with God. You are adopted into the family of God. You become a child of God. He said that gospel which I preach unto you is not according to man. It was the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you know, Paul, Peter had been talking about the second coming of Christ. And he had been talking about this second coming of Christ. And he said, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now the same understanding concerning the second coming of the Lord, Paul had. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as deep in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to salvation, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You will see then the understanding of Paul the Apostle in the Gospel of the Lord, what he knew. And what was making known to the people of God. First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 6. And you remember that when Peter was talking to those believers, writing to those believers, he said, according to the wisdom which God has given unto him. It says in First Corinthians 2 6, how be it, we speak wisdom. We speak wisdom. My rebuke, we speak wisdom. We preach the judgment of God, we speak wisdom. We preach the rapture, we speak wisdom. We correct, we even deceive and say, cast out that man that has committed sin with the father's wife. That is still wisdom. We speak wisdom. How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And then in verse 10, it tells us, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. He said, the Lord has revealed these things to us by his spirit, and we're giving it to the people of God. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. In verse 13, which things also will speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. 
He said, the wisdom of man will brush that aside. That is psychology and the philosophy and the principles and the ways of the world. The way the people of the world try to manifest wisdom. It says, which things also will speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And you see then that Peter recognized God's wisdom and inspiration in Paul's writings. And he equated all his epistles, that is, all the epistles of Paul with the scriptures. He pointed out that unlearned men, unstable men, the rest, the twist, the misinterpret Paul's epistles as they do also other scriptures. In using those words, other scriptures, he was affirming that Paul's epistles as they were scriptures too. Paul had understanding and instruction from the Lord concerning the gospel of full salvation and also the revelation of Christ's second coming. We come to point number three. The perversion of God's love and the scriptures. The perversion of God's love and the scriptures. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, from the middle part, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Here, Peter was saying that when you read the epistle of uh, Paul, you need to understand that if you come with the calf, the Jewish calf, the Jewish mindset, mindset, and the Jewish spectacles, there are some things you will find hard to understand. When you come as a Jew and you are reading the epistles of Paul, you come as a Jew with the mindset of a Jew, with the glasses, the spectacles of a Jew, and with the thinking system of a Jew. You will think that salvation is for the Jews only, and the Gentiles are not supposed to be on equal basis, equal standing with the Jewish people. If you come with that kind of mind, you want to understand the epistles of, of Paul. If you don't understand that we have, we have not the fullness and the abundance of life eternal in Christ and it's made available to everybody, if you don't understand that and you come with that mindset, there will be some things to read in the epistles of, of Paul that you will not be able to understand. And those who are unlearned and unstable, they rest the scriptures that Paul had written. Who are they that are unlearned? That the people that have not taken time to study the scriptures before attempting to teach others. Who are the people that are unstable? They are those people that are, don't have, they don't have settled conviction on sound, solid, biblical doctrines in the scriptures. They are unstable in character. They are unstable in moral principles. And these unlearned people, they are not taking time to study the scriptures comparing scriptures with scriptures, and they are also unstable in character, in moral principles. They don't have conviction. They're wishy-washy. They're shaky. Today they are up. Tomorrow they are down. They rush into the teaching ministry, and they become self-appointed teachers and expounders of the word of God without competent knowledge of the scriptures. God has called me. God has called me. I don't understand the scriptures. They are unlearned, and they are unstable, and they are still very young. And they have not passed through experiences of life, for the storms of life, for the challenges of life, to test their conviction and to make us know whether they are standing, whether they are stable, come what may. And they are not people that know the way with her, how to divide, rightly divide, the watch of truth. And so eventually they just take the scriptures, since they are unlearned and unstable, and they do not have any landmarks to set up that will guide them in interpreting of scriptures. They rest the scriptures. That means they pervert the scriptures. They distort the scriptures. They twist the scriptures. They misunderstand and they misinterpret the scriptures and mislead ignorant souls into false doctrine and error. 
And Paul himself had said, he knew that there were some things that were hard, that were tough, that many people, if they are not really patient to compare scriptures with scriptures, they will not understand. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 12. Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when, I go back to verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Hard to be uttered. He himself knew. Seen. Ye are dull of hearing. For when? For the time. Ye ought to be teachers. Ye have need that won't teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful. Remember, unstable, unlearned, unlearned, unstable. Now unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. A babe, a, a new convert. When we say new convert, that doesn't just mean somebody was converted last year or two years ago. And many people that have been converted for a number of years, they're still like new converts. Because they're not skillful in the word of righteousness. Because he is a babe. He cannot just jump into ministry and jump into interpreting the scripture and jump into establishing a church and jump into I'm the overall leader of this church now and I can teach whatever I want to teach and it doesn't even to have quiet time it doesn't have profitable deep quiet time a babe unskillful in the word of righteousness unlearned unstable They'll be twisting scripture. They'll be bending scripture. They'll be distorting the scriptures. They'll be misinterpreting the scriptures. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even to those who, by reason of use, by reason of exercise, by reason of practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Somebody who is skillful in the word, learned in the word, stable in moral principles and principles of scripture. When false doctrines come, it's able to discern, to differentiate, distinguish between good doctrine and evil doctrine. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Believers, are you listening that there are many that corrupt the word of God? And the reason we are here is so that the shepherd can protect the flock. The reason we are here is so that the teacher can teach the unlearned. The reason we are here is so that the leader can prepare the followers to follow the Lord and to follow Christ. And the reason we say what we say is so that nobody will mislead you. Because of their juggling the scriptures, misinterpreting the scriptures, distorting the scriptures to ruin your life. It's not every poster we see, every handbill we see that we'll be running after. I'm going there, I'm going there, I'm going there. Some of us are not skilled enough to be able to detect false doctrine. And some of those people, they cleverly, um, they, 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 they twist the word of God, they rest the scriptures, and they are clever about it. And you can be deceived. That's the reason why you're listening to all the scriptures, so that you will not remain unlearned, unskillful, and unstable. And here in verse 17, it says, We're not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, will speak in Christ. And this Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. There are people that are, they are dishonest with the word of God. And they know it. At the beginning, they know it. And their conscience will be saying, isn't that a dishonest interpretation? But they silence their conscience and they say the same thing over and over and over again until their conscience will keep quiet, until God will just leave them to go on in their delusion. And I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking craftily, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There are people that do that. There are people that do that. They handle the word of God deceitfully or by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience 
in the sight of God. Chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11, I'm reading to you from verse 3. But I fear, lest by enemies, as a serpent beguiled you, through a subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It says, I'm afraid that some people that have their own private agenda, some people that have their ulterior motives, some people that just want to win you away from Christ so that you can be their friend and so that they can depend upon you, so that instead of you being a disciple of Christ, you'll be their disciple. I'm afraid that these people can come and with their cleverness and craftiness and subtlety, they will turn you away from the Lord. It says in verse 13, For such are false apostles. When you just say apostle, apostle, is it a good apostle, a right apostle, a biblical apostle, or a false apostle? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And as the reason you want to be careful, you don't just want to run after everybody, run after this one and run after that one, so that you do not destroy yourself. It should be stable, stable, not unstable, and learn it. You should understand the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verse 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Come back to this uh, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and verse 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in, the, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest twist, pervert, distort, misinterpret, as they do also the other scriptures. Unto their own destruction, unto their own destruction, unto their own destruction. Please understand. Those who jump into ministry without real, stable understanding of the totality of the revelation of the Word of God, and then they begin to teach false doctrine and enjoying themselves and a gathering crowd and gathering this and gathering this. And you say, Well, I'm going to, I'm going there too. And they are distorting scriptures. And you know that they are changing scriptures. You know they are twisting scriptures. You know they are misinterpreting scriptures. And you still stay there. Because of one thing or the other. It says they themselves and the people that stay with them. It is to their own destruction. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 verse 14. Matthew chapter 15 verse 14. Here yeah, it says let them alone. Leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Don't join them. There's destruction there. There's perdition there. The end of that thing is hellfire. If we stay in false doctrine, twisting scripture, resting scripture, misinterpreting scripture, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into, tell me out loud, into the deed. You don't want to do that. How can you come to the Bible study here and we don't tell you what the truth is? And don't make you to avoid getting into error, getting into perdition. James chapter 3 verse 1. James chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, be not many teachers, be not many overseers, be not many founders of ministries and founders of churches. Brethren, be not many masters. Don't jump into this thing. 
Because if you're still unstable, if you're still unlearned, and you jump into ministry, establishing something, you destroy yourself, and you're going to destroy other people. My brethren, be not many masters. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, the greater condemnation, because you're not just responsible for your own personal, private life now, you're also responsible for the lives of other people that are following you. Be not many masters, because if you jump into that thing and you teach wrong doctrine, you're going to receive the greater condemnation. Second Peter chapter 2. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and shall bring upon themselves sweet destruction upon themselves. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. That's why the Lord is uh, warning us and is telling us that we need to remain stable and steadfast in the word of the Lord. Come to Second Peter chapter 3 as we come to conclusion in verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved children of God, people of God, see that ye know these things that we have been talking about now. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, Fall from your own steadfastness. I pray you will not fall. Amen. But you know what the Lord has taught us today? The Lord has taught us that even though Peter had been publicly rebuked by Paul, he didn't have, attitude. He didn't have a negative attitude. He didn't have a kind of rebellious attitude. He didn't have a judgmental attitude. He didn't have a condemning attitude. He didn't tune Peter up. He didn't tune Paul up because of the things that, you know, Paul had said before. He knew Paul was right, and he knew he was wrong. He just accepted that, kept quiet about that. And when it came time to even talk about Paul, he said, Our beloved brother Paul, in the wisdom that God has given him, how is your own heart? If you are partaking in the rebuke, and the chastisement and the discipline, private or public before. What has been your attitude since that time? Is it that in the attitude now, ego has been affected, and therefore there is settled permanent anger? Or can you still joyfully still talk about that fall and still recommend and still say, I know he has the wisdom of God. The Lord has taught us just to brush all this ego aside and come to the Lord with a free mind and say, yes, Lord, I thank you for your word. I accept your word. And whichever direction is coming from and whatever method is used, I praise you that you have counted me worthy to hear your word. Why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Whatever you still need to do in my life to perfect me and to cleanse me and to purge me and to prepare me for the coming glory and for heaven. Here, Lord, I am ready. All the malice and all the anger and all the bitterness and all the criticism and all the fighting, I surrender everything. I just want to serve you for the rest of my life. The reason I'm coming here is so that the word of God can cleanse me, so that the word of God can challenge me, so that the word of God can correct me, and so that the word of God will be able to wash me from all my shortcomings and all my evil. Thank you, Lord, for what you have revealed to me today. I accept, I believe, and I will not join the doubters, the unlearned, and the unstable, and the unskillful, and the people that are twisting the scriptures, and the people that are misunderstanding the long suffering of God, and the patience of God. Thank you, Lord, for your patience with me. Give me your grace today, so that I can move forward in the things of the Lord. Pray unto the Lord before you go, so that the Lord can do something marvelous in your life, before you go.